Good afternoon and welcome to Hillsborough County Presents All That Jazz. This is Renee McCummings and I am thrilled to be here as part of this exciting Black History Month presentation. To get things started, I'd like to introduce you to your host and commentator for today, our very own Chief Human Services Administrator, Carl Harness. Carl, I'm so glad to be here with you, and please uh, share with us what our viewers have in store for them this afternoon. Thank you, Renee. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carl Harness, Chief Human Services Administrator for Hills Hillsborough County. I'm proud to welcome you to our Black History Month celebration. Hillsborough County's virtual Black History Month jazz event, All That Jazz, we will discuss how jazz music transcends cultural differences and brings people together. These conversations will explore the African-American experience to jazz music and its influence on American culture. But before we begin, Board of County Commissioners, Commissioner Gwen Myers and Commissioner Kimberly Oberman and County Administrator Bonnie Wise would like to say a few words. Commissioner Myers will speak and present a proclamation recognizing all that Jazz Day. Commissioner Myers, welcome. Thank you, Carl. I cannot think of a better way to celebrate Black History Month than to explore the wonderful art of jazz music, how it has strengthened African American culture, and how it has wonderfully ability to bring people of all races, culture, and creeds together. The late, great Louis Armstrong once said, if you have to ask what jazz is, you'll never know. I couldn't agree more. Jazz is more than music. It's a symbol of vitality, passion, and freedom. It is also illustrate how life can be so spontaneous. After all, one of the foundations of jazz is improvisation. Why do you think countless talented jazz musicians play for hours on the end in one night of simply following the rhythm of the saxophone or the beat of the drum. Since the early 20th century, jazz popularity rose dramatically. It has helped black musicians to explore important topics and themes that serve as a foundation of our heritage. Pioneers like Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, have inspired future generations of jazz who keeps the rhythm of the culture alive. These future generations include Herbie Hancock, Bradford, and Winston Marcellus, Keith Jarrett, and especially these three talented musicians who are joining us today, Jasmine Gant, Charleston Singletary, and Dr. Jose Valento Ruiz. I hope all of you enjoy all that jazz. To commemorate this event, it is my privilege to present this proclamation declaring February 25th, 2021 as All That Jazz Day in Hillsborough County. And the proclamation reads, whereas music has the ability to interpret and influence people's feelings serving as a powerful means of communication and whereas more than many of the forms of artistic expression, jazz embodies the synthetics of different cultures in a harmonious ensemble, and whereas improvisation and interpretation are extensive components that help make jazz in every renewing form simonious with freedom, both for players who are free to invent and create each time they play and for the listeners and where it's a unique American institution. Jazz was created in the African American communities in the late 19th and early 20th centuries with New Orleans and its diverse population playing a major role. And whereas as people of African, French, Caribbean, Italian, German, Mexican, American Indians, and English descent interact with each other. African American musical tradition mixed with others, and jazz emerged from a blend of ragtime, marches, blues, and other forms of music. And whereas the brilliant musicians and singers such as 
Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, John Cotran, Theomnis Monk, Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Ella Fitzgerald, Billy Holiday, and many more leading the way, jazz spreads from the United States to many other parts of the world. And whereas the Black History Month is observed across the United States every February to celebrate African American achievements and recognize the crucial role they have played in the United States history. And whereas the Hillsborough County African American Heritage Committee is proud to present All That Jazz, a retrospective on how jazz music transcend our cultural differences and bring people together. A Black History Month virtual event featuring prominent jazz artists and county officials. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Hillsborough County, Florida, does hereby declare February 25th, 2021, all that jazz day in Hillsborough County and encourages all residents to learn more about the historic genes of jazz music, the major role African Americans played in its establishment and the joy these art artists continue to bring throughout the world. Executed this 25th day of February, 2021, signed by all seven commissioners. Additionally, I'm proud to present to all three of our esteemed and talented guests a commendation, each, each of which recognizes and celebrate their achievements in their careers. Congratulations and thank you for all your work and for joining us today. We look forward to hearing and enjoying all of that jazz. Thank you, Commissioner Myers. It is now my pleasure to introduce County Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Thank you very much for um, being here today. Thank you, Carl, for the introduction. I have the honor and pleasure of not only providing my comments, but uh, Commissioner Kemp's comments as she's unfortunately unable to join us today. So if you indulge me, it might be a little longer than I'd planned. But it's an amazing, this is an amazing event that will shed light on how jazz has not only influenced African American culture, but also additionally, how significantly it impacts Hillsborough County in so many exciting ways. Tampa was once considered the Harlem of the South. The city's legendary Central Avenue Music Club was a milestone stop for many black performers. Its famous headliners included Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday, and James Brown. Ella Fitzgerald wrote her famous song, A Tisket, A Tasket, in Tampa. And Ray Charles began his illustrious career in our amazing city. And of course, we must never forget the Jackson House, the 24 room boarding home for African American historical figures who stayed there. Much noted guests such as James Brown, Ella Fitzgerald, Cab Calloway, to name a few. In fact, last year, the Hillsborough County Historic Preservation Challenge grant program awarded the Tampa Bay History Center $70,000 for the virtual recreation of this landmark to help tell its story. Now, as of, the county has allocated $250,000 for the support of the Jackson House. And these are a few examples of how jazz has played a significant part in our community's history. I'm so happy that we have the opportunity to learn about Hillsborough County's contribution to jazz and to enjoy our musical heritage. Thank you so, so very much. It, it is what makes jazz special, and it's the strong and durable music that is not only smooth, but meditative. That's why jazz is so tireless. I spent a little bit of my childhood in New Orleans and became a lifelong fan of jazz. 
and it's a dynamic nature seems to repel all negativity and it welcomes a special type of harmony that influences both performers and listeners. Jazz is very much alive in Hillsborough County. Music lovers of all ages are spellbound by the performances that grace our numerous diverse venues, such as the historic Tampa Theater, the Firehouse Cultural Center, the Jazz on the Lawn by Project Link, and of course, the Gasparilla Music Festival. Let's not forget the small jazz clubs that are striving to survive throughout the county that attract residents and visitors alike. There's an endurance of jazz that's also endurance in those jazz performers. Even with the onset of COVID-19, the sounds of jazz music can be seen, heard, and experienced virtually throughout the Tampa Bay area. One such example of that is the Tampa Jazz Club, a nonprofit organization that hosts programs at the University of South Florida of Music and the Main Stage Theater at Hillsborough Community College in Ebor, of which I have spent quite a bit of time enjoying. I encourage all of you to watch, learn, and enjoy as Carl speaks with these three talented jazz artists whose achievements are countless. And so thank you so much for putting this together today. Carl? Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Overman. And finally, uh, we'd like to hear a few words from our county administrator, Ms. Bonnie Wise. Thank you, Carl. I'm so excited to be here today for All That Jazz. Our community treasures all forms of artistic celebration film, painting, literature, theater, and music, and Hillsborough County will always be dedicated to preserving our cultural and artistic history through numerous programs. One such example is the Hillsborough County Public Art Program, which provides for the Board of County Commissioners to acquire, by purchase or commission, works of art for sites throughout the county. We are also partnered with the Hillsborough Arts Council each year, the Arts Council awards over $400,000 in grants to support the visual and performing arts. Organizations that have received support include music, arts, and theater programs at local colleges and universities. Additionally, the county's cultural assets program has supported numerous music festivals through the Special Events Partnership Grant. Courtesy of this program, the county has awarded $1.4 million to arts and cultural festivals, including the Uptown Music Festival and the East West Music and Dance Festival, just to name a few. I am pleased to be part of today's program. I encourage you to discover how Hillsborough County truly loves all that jazz. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Commissioner Myers, Commissioner Overman, uh, County Administrator Bonnie Wise. And uh, now I'd like to do a brief introduction to, to today's panelists. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have with us Ms. Jasmine Gent. She is a dynamic force within the contemporary jazz field, uh, saxophonist. Uh, she hails from Huntsville, Alabama. However, we are very fortunate that she now lives in our area. She currently lives in Lakeland, Florida, and she has taken her talents to all over the United States and abroad and we are very happy to have her here, and you'll hear more about her later. We also have with us Mr. Charlton Singleton, native of Charleston, South Carolina, very much known for his skills on the trumpet, his direction of jazz orchestration, and, and many other talents which you will hear about. Charlton also is a, a very celebrated uh, artist. He, too, has been all over the United States and playing all over the world. And finally, you'll be hearing from Dr. Jose Valentino Ruiz, who fortunately for us is a, is, is a native of Tampa, now living in Gainesville. We hope to get him back at some point soon. Jose is a, a multi-instrumentalist, also very renowned for his playing. Jose has taken his music, again, throughout the country and throughout the world, and you'll be hearing more from him a little later also. Carl, I have to tell you something. As a 
as a lover of all music and not the aficionado that I have learned that you are <laughs> when it comes to jazz. I am so excited to be sharing this time with you and to, to learn more about jazz, to learn more about how it has transformed our culture and our country and the contributions of our guest uh, musicians today. I have to also say that it is so exciting to be a part of this day, this all that jazz day, and to hear from our commissioners and our county administrator uh, and welcoming this great occasion. So with that, let's go ahead and just launch right in. And can you tell us a little bit about our first guest? And that would be Charlton Singleton. Sure, Renee. Charlton Singleton, as I had said earlier, is a talented multi-instrumentalist from South Carolina. He's South Carolina native, widely known for his skills playing the trumpet. He is the co-founder, and he has conducted the Charleston Jazz Orchestra, in addition to leading his own jazz ensembles in various sizes and styles. Charlton also does little contemporary jazz, and obviously he does traditional jazz. Charlton has performed throughout the world and the United States, and, and this, is, this is critical here. He is, the, he is the founding member of this new ensemble that you know, some of you may have heard of called Ranky Tanky. This group is a quintet that interprets, it, to interprets the sound of Gullah music. Gullah is a culture that originated among descendants of enslaved Africans in the Low Country region of the Southwest United States. And Ranky Tankies, the, with their, their sophomore release, Good Times, uh, they recently, recently won a Grammy Award at the end of 2020 for Best Regional Roots Album. So, you know, we are very proud of, of Charlton and Ranky Tanky for that. And I wanted to congratulate Charlton and the band recently on receiving that Grammy Award that recognized Gullah Music and its historical contribution to music. And, and Charlton, you know, I, I went back and I watched your Grammy acceptance speech, and, and I, I noticed that there was this, this, this raw sense of emotion came out as you spoke about Gullah music finally being accepted within the mainstream of the music industry. Ranky Tanky is more than the name of, 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 the, of your band. Tell us about the significance of the name to the music you play and its origin of Gullah, and the origin of Gullah music. For, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Carl. Always good to uh, hear when you call me up. I'm like, where, where are we going? What are we doing? Let's go. <laughs> Well, with regards to Gullah, uh, first of all, you got to understand the, 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 the Gullah Geechee Corridor, which is basically a set of islands that start on the southern uh, coast of, of North Carolina, and it stretches down the coast of uh, South Carolina, down the coast of Georgia, and to the top <clears throat> of Florida around the Jacksonville area. And along the coast, just off of the mainland of the United States, you have all of these little islands. And um, these islands for many, many years were only reachable by boat. But on these islands, you had former, uh, many, many, many years ago, we're talking, you know, um, 18th century and stuff like that, going back that far. Uh, you had former West African slaves that lived on these islands. And they were able to maintain a lot of things, how they, how they prepared food, how they entertain themselves, how they worshiped, how they did arts and crafts, a whole bunch of things. And so um, the, uh, a, a unique language that they, that they sort of came up with, that's the Gullah Geechee Corridor, as we call it. With regards to Ranky Tanky, Ranky Tanky is actually a kid's game. Now, there's so many things from the Gullah Geechee community or the, the, just the Gullah community that you probably have come in contact with over the years, but you probably didn't know that that was the origin. Things like Sweetgrass Baskets, songs like Kumbaya or Michael Row the Boat Ashore, all of those things are uniquely Gullah. With Ranky Tanky, that's actually a kid's game. And if any of you all have ever played Patty Cake or something like that or seen little girls or, or boys or kids playing that, um, the the whole thing about them doing that and clapping on beats two and four, that's uniquely Gullah. So there's a particular 
game that these kids would play called Ranky Tanky. And the song goes, old lady come from Booster, had two hands and a rooster. The rooster died, the old lady cried, now she don't eat eggs like she used to. Paint in my head, Ranky Tanky. Ranky Tanky loosely translates to mean to work it or get funky with it, and you want to sort of shake it off, basically. Uh, paint in my head, Ranky Tanky. Paint in my hands, Ranky Tanky. Paint in my feet, Ranky Tanky. Paint all over me, Ranky Tanky. So imagine kids doing this. It's a, it's a game. It's a game that they would play outside or on the playground nowadays or something like that. We loved that particular game and thought it was a catchy title, um, and so we decided to name our band after it, and um, it's worked in our favor very well. I believe we have a clip that we're going to share with everybody uh, regarding the uh, Ranky Tanky demo. Oh, let it come from Booster, with two hands and a rooster. The rooster died, oh, let it cry, and she put it in to the rooster. Oh, let it come from Booster, with two hands and a rooster. The rooster died, oh, let it hide, and she put it in to the rooster. Oh, my, you look so, oh, my, you look so. Who been here since I've been gone? Two little boys with the blue caps on. Charlton, I, I, was, I was digging those harmonies and that quadraphonic look. That was that was pretty right. slick. <laughs> so, Charlton, look, tell us, how has Gullah music influenced jazz, pop, rhythm and blues, and soul music of our times? Well, first off, let's just start with the obvious. You have to remember that Gullah predates all of this. We're talking, you know, the first. The first West Africans actually landed in, in South Carolina in the 1600s. We don't even get to jazz or any talk about the music that we celebrate nowadays until we get to, you know, the, the late, mid, mid to late, at earliest, 1800s or whatever have you like that. That particular rhythm, you can find remnants of the Gullah rhythm in just about any of the uh, popular music styles that we have today, whether it's jazz, whether it's blues or, or um, spirituals and gospel, whether it's folk music, you know, one of the things that, that, uh, that brought us sort of together as this band was our guitarist saying how he was, you know, traveling all over the world and he would be in some place, uh, like one specific time he was in Brazil and he heard this rhythm and he said, Oh, man, that sounds like what I hear, you know, my friends playing at church in downtown Charleston, you know. Um, and so the connectability of it all, really, you can find a lot of, of, of similarities in what was happening with the Gullah community all over the world and, and how it has spread. Just like I tell everybody, I mean, there's not a whole lot of people on the earth that don't know Kumbaya. And Kumbaya is like, like I said, it's probably the most well-known Gullah song on the face of the earth. Just a whole lot of things that, you know, that, that, that clap like that, you know, you can, you can look at reggae music and when they, you know, it's all connected. It's all connected and Gullah predating all of that really gives it that definitely that, that vibe of it's, it's coming from that, that West African experience and that Gullah experience. Well, Charlton, thank you very much. And, and from what I understand, you have another video to show us. Um, uh, again, thank you for being here. And, um, you know, like I said, next time I'm coming to, to Charleston, I'm going to come over to the house so I can hold that Grammy and get my picture with it so I can say I touched one. But, right. man, really appreciate you. and We're so proud of you. But uh, can, you, can, you, um, can you queue up the next video we're about to see and, and tell folks what they're, they're getting ready to experience? 
Absolutely. So with our band Ranky Tanky, um, we do a contemporary assessment of a lot of the Gullah songs and um, um, kids' games. And so this clip that you're going to see now is our version of the song I just did, Ranky Tanky. Before, when you saw it with me, that's in its sort of purest form with, you know, just using your voice and your hands to clap and your feet to, you know, stomp on the floor. Um, but now that we've, you know, plugged in a guitar, we've got a full drum set, we've got a stand-up bassist, we've got a trumpet player, and now uh, this is sort of the contemporary version of uh, how we would treat one of the Gullah standards. Thanks again so much. Absolutely, bro. Who is the greatest? We are the greatest. Are you sure? Yeah. Positive. Yeah. Positive. Yeah. All, all right, right. all right. Old lady come from old star. Had two hands and a roll star. Roots to die. The old lady cried. Now she don't need eggs like she used to star. Old lady come from old star. Had two hands and a roll star. Roots to die. The old lady cried. Now she don't need eggs like she used to star. Oh my, you look so. Oh my, you look so. Been hooping in since I've been gone. Two little boys with a blue cap on, leaning on a hickory stick. Probably gonna slap them good. Paint in my head. Well, I'm going to have to come on camera just for a minute here to just say that was pretty awesome, um, and I'm and I'm glad no one could see all the dancing going on back here behind the scenes. <laughs> so, so I'll be hiding off camera, getting my groove on. All right. Uh, thank you so much, so much, Charlton, for your contribution. Oh wait. <laughs> And Commissioner Overman, she's saying, yes, yeah, same thing, yes. Yeah. I was doing the same thing. I was like, oh, boy, that's awesome. That's terrific. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Absolutely. No oh, problem. that was awesome. That was awesome. So, so okay, and I guess since I'm on camera, and I'm, I'm, I'll just kind of stay on for just a minute here, to uh, just say, uh, so we've, we've kind of got the historic kind of uh, uh, beginnings here. Um, Carl, tell us a little bit about... Uh, about our next guest and and how she adds another dimension to to the uh, the uh, transformation uh, that uh, music and jazz has had on our culture and not just on our our uh, kind of ethnic culture but also the fact that she's a uh, a female breaking into this contemporary jazz scene. Can you tell us a little bit about our next guest? Sure, Renee. Uh, Miss Jasmine Gent is one of the most sought after national smooth, ja smooth jazz and recording, recording artists today. Uh, Jasmine is also an accomplished educator for students grades K through five. Uh, Jasmine was recently invited to, by the U.S. Embassy 
in Haiti to spend seven days in Haiti presenting music and workshops to adults and children. Jasmine also has the distinct honor of being voted 2017's Best Smooth Jazz Artist by Billboard and was winner of the prestigious 2019 NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Jazz Album entitled The Story of Jazz. Jasmine currently has three top charting singles on Billboard. Renee, I believe you have a clip that you wanted to show everybody on Jasmine. I do. We're going to start that right now. Hello, Jasmine. Hello. Thank you so How, much for having me. Oh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. You know, I, I remember I remember starting to follow you. It must have been around uh, maybe late 2013 through 2014. And I, I remember your first album came out in 2015 called Entitled The Boss. And then you followed that up with a sophomore project in 2016 called Chocolate Sunshine. And it was just, you, you took the contemporary jazz industry by storm. You just, this, this dynamic force just showed up. And you were so young and so talented and so beautiful. And it was a breath of fresh air for a lot of us longtime contemporary jazz folks that would go with, you know, these festivals. And we were looking for something new and something inspiring. And you definitely brought that. Let, let me ask you, what and who and inspired you to get involved in the music, and what has been your experience as a young African-American female coming into the contemporary jazz scene? Oh, wow. So thank you so much. I'm very humbled by, by your kind words. I have to say my parents actually, they love jazz music. So it's funny, on their first date, they talked about if they had kids, they'd name child Jasmine. So uh, I always say I feel like I was destined to play jazz. <laughs> you know, one day my mom came home and they had hundreds of CDs. So I would hear sounds like Kirk Whalum, um, Yellow Jackets. I mean, I would hear everything. Luther Van Joss, you know. And my mom brought home the saxophone one day and she said, you're going to play this. And I said, no. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I didn't have a choice. And, and I'm thankful that that, you know, she pushed me to play or else I wouldn't be here uh, right now. So my parents really inspired me. And I was in, I was in middle school and here I am playing the saxophone and learning jazz music, imitating these artists. Uh, and it was interesting because I started noticing when I would go to um, even play at church, play at jazz clubs, I started seeing few and, and fewer uh, women. And then on top of that, like African-American women, I, I didn't see any. So I felt like these people to uh, look up to or these people that even mentors, you know, I, I hungered for that. And they're there. There are women who play jazz music and who are even instrumentalists. But unfortunately, I just wasn't familiar with many of them. As, and I, I really wish I had that. And I strive to provide that for women nowadays. So one thing I, I would notice is, we all know, of course, this discrimination, which is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people or things, and especially on race and age. And gender discrimination in jazz music is all the way down to even the teaching methods. I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, if you ask someone, who are some jazz musicians you know? You know, they would say Sarah Vaughn, they would say Ella Fitzgerald, you know, they would say um, Billy Holiday, who are all very amazing um, in their own right, but you just don't hear about like Byred, 
who played the saxophone with the Count Basie Orchestra. You know, you don't hear about Lynn Milano or all these amazing instrumentalists as well. So uh, with that comes comes things like tokenism, where you're one of like very few women. Uh, I remember in college, I was uh, one of three women uh, out of 50 jazz students. So, and it, it provides immense stress because you want to, to debunk the stereotype that women can't play and, and, you know, all they can do is, I mean, we have gender roles in music, like um, the mother role or the seductress role. And I, so these things don't only take place in society, but they also take place within music. And again, I strive to change these. I, I remember my first experience with gender discrimination. I was in uh, middle school. I was going to high school. I went to this jazz camp called Jamie Abersole Jazz Camp. And you have hundreds of musicians from all over. Uh, and they're auditioning for these um, jazz combos and, and quartets. And I find out my placement. I had my audition. And I go up to the door, knock on the door. And I'm like, I'm here. I'm here for us to play and practice. And I said, is this room four? rehearsal and they looked at me and it was five men and they said yes and then they closed the door <laughs> and, um, so that was like oh my like, I, I didn't know how to respond didn't know what that was and i just had grown accustomed to these types of environments and you know again m women see that and they think you know i can't do that because women are supposed to sing women are supposed to play uh play orchestral instruments you know, it, it can be uncomfortable. And so I, I'm i thankful for all of those experiences. There's pros and cons with everything. But I think, if anything, I would like to be uh, that that role model and just, again, stop a lot of these uh, tokenism situation, stereotype threat where you're having to prove um, people wrong. Okay. And, and, I, and I think um, – <clears throat> You brought a, a, another video clip with you um, to, to, to show the audience. Um, can you tell us a little bit of something about Heat? Yes, yes. So that actually came off of my third CD, uh, and it's entitled uh, The Story of Jazz. And, and it that CD just exudes a lot of things that have um, happened within my life up to that point. So uh, Heat is just a fun Latin song, and I actually have a new CD that just came out, uh, Forever Jazz. So, in a, a continuation of the life story, but yes, that's heat. All right, let's let's check that out.
Wow, that was incredible, Jasmine. That was that was awesome. Those of you folks out there, you got to get that latest CD and get yeah. other CDs too. I'd like to, I'd like Jasmine, I'd like to ask you one more question because uh, I know this is an important part of your life, and and I'm sure you serve as a role model to many African American young women and non minority young women and girls out there seeing you do what you do. Uh, tell us real quickly why teaching music to children in the classroom and and as we had talked about earlier you going to Haiti why teaching music to children is so important oh my goodness because that's the foundation I the purpose of teaching is for us to prepare our students for for the world to be um, citizens to make an, a difference and an impact so that's I feel is the most impressionable time you know I saw um, a study and it's by uh, an amazing music philosopher her name's Lucy Green and the study was saying was shown that teachers actually are the ones who influence these students and say, hey, girls are the, the ones who sing and boys are the ones who play these instruments, girls do this. I mean, so it shows how impressionable teachers can be. So I want to leave um, the right impression and a lasting impression on my students. And actually now I'm, I'm teaching on the collegiate level uh, at USF and getting my doctorate. So I want to be able to I'm teaching and expand, um, and as I always say, just be on my purpose. <laughs> well, Jasmine, let me tell you, not only are you leaving a lasting impression on your students, but I think you're leaving a lasting impression on all of us uh, for all of your accomplishments and, and, and everything you do and everything that you're destined to do, and we're just glad to have you as a member of our community, and uh, I'm just grateful that you were able to take time out to join us today for this event. Renee? Honored to be here. Thank you. I echo that wholeheartedly, and, and I'm just really glad that uh, uh, your mom didn't give up when you said no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that you persevered when the door got closed in your face. Uh, I'm really glad that you have, have made that commitment to leave a legacy. Okay, uh, with with uh, the people that you do touch, be it through your work uh, uh, in schools and in education. Glad to hear you're getting that doctorate, go girl. And and then also just uh, uh, the fact that uh, you are out here uh, sharing your beautiful gift and talents with with us. Uh, that was that was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. So goodness gracious. Yeah, uh, buddy. <laughs> So, one great, so, one great after another. So we've had the historical perspective, uh, a great uh, look uh, at contemporary jazz and how um, uh, the female presence, okay, is changing jazz uh, and and the contribution that uh, female artists are making, and uh, not just to music but to the community and to the educational setting. Um, our next guest, can you share a little bit about how he is actually influencing the world of music with his uh, gifts and talents? Certainly, Renee. Oh, oh, my goodness. My brother, Dr. Ruiz. Jose is an internationally acclaimed recording and performing artist. Uh, he's a talented multi-instrumentalist who's performed throughout the world, and, 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 and you, you have to see it to, to, to experience. He gives these high-energy performances in various styles. He integrates contemporary jazz with Latin wow. music, Latin jazz, and funk, and fusion, and pop, and R&B. And, and, and Jose is just a beast. He plays everything, keyboards, bass, drums, congas. He sings. He improvises. Saxophone, flute. Just when you think you've seen it all, he's picking up something else, and he's playing it. Uh, Dr. Ruiz is currently the head of the Music Business and Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, uh, he heads that up for the University of Florida in Gainesville. He has been the recipient of many prestigious awards. Uh, among them, in 2018, he was a Global Music uh, Award winner for the Best New Age Music as Recording Engineer and Producer. In 2018, he won an Emmy Award uh, for Best Cultural Document Documentary as the media composer, producer, and musician. In 2019, he received a, Grammy, a Latin Grammy Award for Best Christian Album in Spanish Language Music as a recording engineer and featured artist. And then again, similar to Charlton, recently in 2020, 
He received his second Latin Grammy Award for Best Classical Contemporary Composition as the co-primary artist, co-composer, and instrumentalist. And most recently, he's been recognized to receive the 2021 USF Outstanding Young Alumni Award. Jose, welcome. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How do I follow the other two that are just so outstanding? My gosh, I feel out of place. I, first of all, uh, you know, it's really an honor to be here. It's also an honor to be in the presence of such, uh, you know, contemporary greatness such as Jasmine. I applaud you for everything that you're doing. You are extraordinary, and your sound, your musicianship, the heart, the intensity of what you do is just fabulous. Also a fan of Lucy Green, who you quoted, and, and uh, we have to converse because I love what you do. And, of course, Charlton is my brother from another mother who was introduced to me by the great, the one and only Carl Harness. And uh, Charlton is also a career mentor of mine in recent years. And uh, so I love both of them, and, and truthfully, I'm, I am really humbled to be here. Uh, to be able to share with you all. Jose, you know, your accomplishments speak for themselves uh, in music. And, and you have utilized your music through your missionary work. And for those of us who know you, and, you know, I've been, I've been a fan of yours and following you for over a decade now. I didn't quite watch you grow up, and I've kind of watched you kind of grow up, so to speak. For those of us who know you, we see you more as, a, as an activist and an advocate for integration and positive change. Jose, can you, can you share with the, the viewers today, what role does your music specifically play in the evolution of jazz as a music genre? Absolutely, it plays three roles, it's threefold, uh, Carl. It's missiological, it's educational, and it's entrepreneurial. Missiological, because my background as a missionary, I have a doctorate of ministry with the emphasis in global outreach in addition to the PhD. I've, I've led 40 plus mission trips in which we bring in jazz education and, and partner up with uh, educational nonprofit organizations in other countries in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East. And we use jazz education as a vessel to help cultivate the artistic identity, purpose, and roles of students that are there because jazz teaches us how to be free in our expressivity, how to be able to express and relate with one another with a sense of community and, and how we can be um, unified together and be able to engage in uh, community outreach and activism. So I use jazz education um, as a platform to be able to um, help those communities that might not have as much access to, to engage in dialogue and, and basically community building. It's also educational. My role uh, in, at the University of Florida, one of the courses I teach is social impact of music entrepreneurs, and it's really exciting to be able to discuss the roles that jazz musicians have had, chronologically speaking, as global ambassadors, such as the great Dizzy Gillespie, who literally was a, an actual U.S. ambassador and did a, a cultural exchange with Cuba to help find common ground and be able to relate, but also to educate the, you know, black Americans that were stripped away from their cultural practices, especially with percussion. That is very present in in Afro-Cuba and Afro-Puerto Rican, of which I am an Afro-Puerto Rican. And so, you know, bringing that back, that aspect of the identity that was stripped away back in America, I think is really wonderful because we have to be able to celebrate who we were to understand how we are going to proceed further in our ability to inspire a, a, the future generation while maintaining the essence of what we value as sacred. And in addition, in that class, what's really exciting is we actually study the entrepreneurial methods of how they went about to establish their platform. Because you see, jazz is not just the music. It's understanding. It's being a solutionist. And we can talk about that a little bit further. The third part is entrepreneurialism, which um, in my role, one of the things that I have helped do through education and through missiological uh, activism is partner up with people to find ways that we can bridge gaps and needed areas of communication specifically with other companies 
See, companies can thrive, but one thing that we need to understand is that any company that is non-music based needs to have the arts because arts is humanity expressed. And so to be able to sell the product or to deliver the service amazingly well, we need to be able to find ways to incorporate media and music to attract those people that we want to reach. And jazz is just one of those eclectic genres that breaks barriers and helps us see each other at a common ground. So that's and, and, the three roles that I engage in. That's awesome, Jose. And before we go to the next question, uh, l let us uh, share a, a short clip of uh, to give folks a little bit of idea of uh, what you're about musically. some serious flute playing there my brother <laughs> yeah well that was interesting because um that see that's just an example you know i mean if you were to look at uh my website you would see a lot of photos and all kinds of different settings uh and and really i don't need to always play at the carnegie halls at the rca dome you know if you get me uh in another country out on the street you know in a local community that just needs to be able to hear something that empowers people i will do it you know all sweaty in this particular context i was invited at a university and they were wanting to see how we can uh, they wanted to see a representative model of what, uh, you know, cross-generational and cross-cultural expression could look like. And so the cross-generational aspect was the fact that we're using, uh, you know, jazz elements, but also contemporary elements and mixing it with the music of today, which, you know, in this era of AI and digital technology, there you go. I produced all that music uh, really quickly, but then, uh, you know, and we have that kind of electronica but then we have the cross-cultural elements, which you saw the congas there have the Puerto Rican flag there represent, woo-hoo, right? But then the music that I was playing was the tinges of Middle Eastern expression as well at the beginning. Right? And so then there was, towards the end, a little bit of, uh, you, you know, some African elements uh, with my improvisation, things that might not be as noticeable, um, but that's not what matters. What matters is, is that people see and can, and can sense, um, you, you know, subconsciously uh, the unity of a cultural understanding embedded within the music. I, I definitely have to say before I go off camera, the intensity was what I, I gathered. The, the, the ferociousness with which you uh, play such a delicate <laughs> instrument. I, I, I think I mentioned to you the idea that the flute could be a percussion instrument is something that kind of warps one's mind. Yeah, that that was, was awesome. I'll go back Renee, to the corner now. You, you should see it. You should see him when he turns that flute into a funk instrument. Yeah, that's a whole different oh, wow. story. Wow. Jose, we, we, we do have a few more minutes, and you you had mentioned something that I think is very important, and we have talked about this before. You you talk you talk about entrepreneurialism. Let me ask you real quickly. What are the opportunities for the next generation of jazz entrepreneurs to influence positive change and expansion at the local and international levels? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me tell you, jazz musicians are solutionists. Okay, let's get that out of the way. We are solutionists. So some of the opportunities, quite frankly, considerations for both jazz musicians, but also for, you know, non-music professionals who are involved in different institutions, corporations, initiatives, let's say even with a county. And you understand this so brilliantly, Carl, is that jazz musicians are solutionists. So nonprofit organizations need to strongly consider partnering up with jazz musicians because 
we are engaging in improvisation all the time. You see, there's four stages to the creative process, and we have a, oftentimes people have a strong desire to want to seek solutions and the results of a strategic initiative, but the creative element needs to be there. And so you can literally employ jazz musicians, whether it's on a project uh, initiative or even just to have on staff, somebody who, yes, is a musician, but even outside, they know how to find the avenues where it may appear that they don't exist. And so, you know, a, a true jazz musician is always seeking solutions to be able to bridge gaps for cultural understanding, for educational initiatives, um, just generational translation, because that's another thing is that we might have really strong initiatives to uh, want to in, empower a community, but how do we translate those initiatives to people that, uh, might, that might need to have that translation? I'm not talking about just language. I'm talking about where it really sticks to the intent, to the mind. The renewing of the mind is really important. And I'm not trying to be new age. I'm just talking about the renewing of the mind, just understanding of what possibilities are there for different communities, for them to, you know, starting with the household, for people to really understand the opportunities. And so jazz musicians know how to translate that through songwriting, through coming up with media content, which I think that's another thing, is that, you know, jazz musicians, they need to find ways to engage with the county, with the community, to engage in cultural ambassadorships. Uh, jazz musicians should embrace technology to become the respective media production companies as well, because every company needs a good jingle, right? Um, <laughs> and also, you know, and I think that a lot of jazz musicians seem to miss out on is that, hey, they can use their platform for addressing a plethora of social issues. They are free in being able to express themselves musically, and the same way we're able to communicate thoroughly. We can come up with different plans and strategies because we can see ideas of how things could manifest in the future, which is a far transfer skill that is actually done within the practice of jazz music. When we're playing a song, we, we, we're trying to think of the final part of the music and build to that intensity while also thinking about how does the audience respond, this product that we're going to do, how do they receive that message, that product, that service. And so there's a lot of, you know, intersection and parallels with entrepreneurial thinking and what it is to be a jazz musician. So those are just some suggestions that I would recommend. Uh, now, Jose, that's why I call you the, 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 the music visionary, because you, you truly are a visionary. Look, I know, I know that you've got a classroom of students waiting for you, and we do. We're going to end the program with you. I want to thank you again for taking your time out to, to come do this for us. And um, I would like you to, any final words you have, and I'd like you to set up, set up what we're about to see in this last video in terms of what inspired you to do it, and you can take us out. The name of this video is, or this composition that I did, uh, which I did the production in Tampa, it's called Time to Wake Up. Okay, and you'll notice how in the percussion, I'm, I'm basic, or the flute, I'm using it as a percussion, and what you're hearing is the musicians, you're hearing the musicians literally kind of sounding like they're just waking up, like something's about to cook. Right. And so these types of presentations should serve as an inspiration. But rather than just inspiring, which the etymology of the word inspiring in the Latin means wind of revelation. It, interestingly enough, I play the flute, which requires the wind. Right. So rather than inspiring, I don't want this to be just an occasion. I want the people who watch this to say, you know what, this is amazing. I want to be a part of this movement. I want to see, can I make a phone call? How can I help? You see? Talk is, is great, but action is even greater. And so I think we're now in a, in, in a position to where we need to understand and embrace ideation, creation, get involved in organization, right? Do informed testing to see how we can actually improve our local community. And this includes jazz musicians to get involved. And I would say for those who are the gatekeepers who are not musicians, but that do have influence within the community, to have a conversation, deeper conversation, listen to the innovative ideas that uh, so often just spawn and, and you know, with, among jazz musicians. And so I think this is an amazing opportunity. And what the song talks about is just serving as a sort of a musical sonic descriptor of the intensity, as Renee mentioned, that I play with, the sense of urgency for us to actually get things done. Because at the pace, we also need to not just um, maintain 
the quality of of the impact of the service of what we're doing, but we also need to do it with a sense of urgency. You see, uh, we we have tasks and time is one of those things that's just like we have to make time. We never have enough time. So what we have to do is know how to compartmentalize unimportant tasks, important tasks, and how to convert those important tasks to urgent tasks. And so when you become uh, when it's not self-centered, but when you think about the bigger picture, how it's going to benefit everybody, there's that's a sense of urgency because that also gives us a sense of purpose. And then we can navigate those different roles that are our purpose expressed. So this is, without further ado, a composition that I wrote called Time to Wake Up. Jose, thank you very much. Let's check All this right. out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks again, Jose. Woo! Man. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I definitely would have blown my cover. You guys couldn't see, couldn't see that at all. That was... <laughs> <laughs> the solo is actually wow. scarier. Wow. Shut up. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. Hey, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. You are just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for all three of our guests. I, I need to see when you all are going to play near me, and when we're free to roam the cabin, as I like to say, I'll travel to see you. I will. I will travel. I will. Thank you All so that much. jazz theme song with Charlton, Jasmine, and Jose Valentino coming up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> noted. Noted. We noted. want to hear that. Thank you. Thank Absolutely amazing. Uh, this is Jasmine. That was absolutely amazing. Uh huh. Here, why don't everybody come on camera? Why doesn't everybody just come on camera and join us uh, for these and, last few moments? And, and I would like to, I would like to again to 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 thank our three celebrated guests. We we were just so fortunate to have all three of you uh, provide us with this perspective. Uh, this was truly a, an amazing day and, and event. And, and and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to do this for the folks here in Hillsborough County. 
Um, and I uh, just have to say, and I know, Carl, you have a few kind of like final closing words for everyone, that it has been uh, my pleasure to be of service, to be a part of this event for Black History Month. It was an idea just a few short weeks ago to know that you all have come. It says a lot about about your your colleague, your mentor, your friend, Carl Harness, and who he is, and I work alongside him. So uh, I know that anytime he calls me, I'm ready and available as well. Um, we know that he is uh, an amazing uh, uh, person and mentor. I thank you all so much uh, for uh, the historical perspective. Uh, again, uh, Charlton that brought back memories for me from uh, my Uncle Bruce doing the hand bone at our birthday party. <laughs> when we were kids and 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 the smooth jazz miss jasmine uh, i thank you so much for for bringing that dimension and adding your dimension to to jazz dr jose valentino ruiz uh wow wow uh fusion jazz contemporary afro cuban puerto rican caribbean all rolled in one uh just um, a force to be reckoned with. It has been my absolute pleasure to share this time with all of you. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Carl. So, Renee, we, we all know with, without the support of our Hillsborough Board of County Commissioners, you know, we couldn't do what we do. So, again, I would like to thank the entire board, uh, particularly County Commissioner Gwen Myers and County Commissioner Kimberly Overman, and uh, especially our uh, County Administrator Bonnie Wise, for, for joining, uh, joining us today on the program. I'd also, again, like to thank our amazing musical guests today for joining us and taking their time. And, and we had other partners involved with this, too. I'd like to thank uh, Ivy Martin, our Human Resources Director, and obviously my co-host, Renee McCummings, for, for all of their work. And, you know, we had a lot of work that was done by our Hillsborough County Communications Department, our IIO Department, uh, our Strategic uh, Relations and Strategic Services. Uh, Albert Coleman, thank you for all that you do and, and for helping us, <clears throat> helping us put this together, particularly our Diversity and Inclusion Project Team. Thank you guys for the vision and for all of the events that you'll be putting together for us. So, Thanks again. This is great. <laughs>